I mean, when people go by counting, they what's that? You know, the signs, some of the signs are still there. So they know there was something there. I'm sure thousands of people have driven by and seen that little piece of property. And then they first see the Scott High School structure, but then there's that little piece of land across the street and everybody, they know it today is the Collingwood Art Center, but what was it before it was the Collingwood Art Center? For over 50 years, on a stretch of property between Collingwood Boulevard and Parkwood Avenue, there stood a Catholic women's college Mary Mance College. It was founded by the Ursuline Sisters at the request of Bishop Samuel Stritch in the early 1920s. It was the bishop's wish that the Ursuline Sisters, the oldest teaching order in the diocese, create a college to educate young women, as he believed that women had the same right as men to the benefits of higher education. On September 15, 1922, the doors of Mary Mance College opened as the first women's Catholic college in the area. When you think of it, they were front Tier people, they were breaking the, the level of what women did. They didn't go out to college. This was something new and different. The nuns seemed to realize that women are going to have a harder time getting a job than the men. And the women are supposed to stay at home, take care of the little ones. And it has all changed. It's, uh, they, they were ahead. They knew. The people at Mary Mann's lived in a time that was opening doors in many ways, and we were, we were encouraged as part of Mary Mann's to go through those doors. I don't know what Toledo would have done without Mary Mance because that's where a lot of the teachers came from. All the nurses came there at least two days a week. Mary Mance College began as a liberal arts college for women, with a focus on preparing young women for careers in education and social work. Over time, Mary Mance also began taking in nursing students from St. Vincent's and Mercy College, as Mary Mance was able to provide the foundation and basics of the science education that nurses needed. In addition, students could pursue coursework in languages, art, and music. No matter which degree a student pursued, all Mary Mance students were required to take at least one philosophy or religion class every semester. We hired some priests from the diocese to teach theology. They took the philosophy and, and theology classes which gave them a, a firm foundation and they were able to be well-rounded women. Mary Mance was a real Catholic school, which they don't emphasize that as much anymore but we had to take religion every semester, all four years. Father Vogel taught cosmology. I never heard of these other philosophies. Did you? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've heard of them. <laughs> Dr. O'Toole <laughs> taught uh, epistemology. Yeah. And metaphysics. <laughs> metaphysics, and ethics, yeah. sociology. Yeah. It wasn't, it's no breeze, let me tell you. They had high ideals for us. And we had small classes, so we could ask questions. I remember going to the University of Cincinnati one summer. There were 250 people in the class. And it was a full day of classes. You didn't, you know, now where you have, you know, three classes on Wednesday and two on Tuesday or whatever. It wasn't, you were there all day. They, they didn't have too many fancy places like you have in colleges today. You know, we, we, we were pretty bare minimum. <laughs> when you think of a college today, it's not like the college when they started with Mary Mans in 1922. They started in neighborhood houses around the building where St. Ursula Academy and St. Angela Hall were located. And then gradually they started to grow. The Ursuline Convent had existed at the property of Collingwood Boulevard since the early 1900s, residing in the Gerber House in 1905, and in 1918, building the five-story brick structure that is known today as the Collingwood Arts Center. To start Mary Mance College, the Ursuline Sisters purchased several buildings and homes around the convent. Offices and classrooms were housed in the Administration Building and the Augustine Hall. A gym was located in the Urban Hall, Brescia Hall was home to science labs, and Immaculata Hall held the bookstore and library. By the 1930s, another home was purchased to meet a growing population, residential students. So we bought a house, it was on the corner of Parkwood and Tennyson, that 
house that was built by the Tidkeys. 20 young women lived in that house and eventually we added on another 20 rooms for people to live so there were 40 students that lived there at one time. Well see I was a boarder. I got a scholarship which included my being a boarder and uh, well we had of course we had to begin at a certain time. I think we had to go to bed by nine o'clock which was okay because I was a, an early to bed goer. That's all, we weren't too restricted. And it was fun just to be a boarder. <laughs> when I was a senior, they decided I should come down here and board for at least three months. And it was kind of nice because we, we weren't in a big dormitory then. We were scattered over in various rooms and we were um, above the library area, I think it was. It was a lot of fun and we did some things that we shouldn't have done, but <laughs> who doesn't? We went out a couple of nights just to, just to, for the fun of saying we got out and were out there for a while and came back in and nobody knew it. The Ursula nuns taught at St. Ursula's in the same place where Mary Mance was. So I thought Mary Mance was going to be like St. Ursula's with a lot of uh, rules, but Mary Mance was different. I really liked it. it they treated us as uh, women, young women, and we were free to do what we wanted. I graduated in 1946, and in 1941, the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor, and so when I entered Mary Mance in 42, our class was the first class to be in the war. My boyfriend went away to the Army in June of 42, and I entered Mary Mance in September. But there, all the other girls had boyfriends too that had gone to war. Nowadays, nobody notices the war very much, but all of our boyfriends were gone. So we became very close. It was, it was kind of an upset time of history. We talked over everything with each other and sympathized and it was, it was kind of a family thing. It, it didn't turn out to be very normal, what you would expect from a bunch of college people. Young women started to go to college because the world was expanding and they needed to have their education broadened and they began to empower them to be women of the future. Mary Mans was, I'd say, an oasis for the young women that were there trying to learn um, in this time of whatever was going on, whether it was World War I or II or Korean War. They were, they were getting their education and they were being wholesome people. For us at that age, it was a very big influence. And as we went through school, of course, all things were, people were coming back from the war and things were changing everywhere. And of course then once the war was over, um, you wanted to go to college, you wanted to get going and move around and, and uh, you were very much needed. You, there were all sorts of jobs available when we graduated in 49 because you still had the, the lack of personnel as a result of the war. So everybody that graduated got a job. You know, and it was doing something that they enjoyed doing. We d did en enjoy many things. I was a member of the uh, card club. We all played bridge, and and we go to different ones, homes, and and play bridge, and then get talking about school. As a class, we had had some we had picnics, get-togethers. We would have dances. We had a dance usually at the end of Lent, Christmas, and at, after Lent, Easter. We'd have a dance and, and invite the boys. We had, um, we had a really a class with a lot of energy. Most people will agree that they often heard someone talking about those 49ers. Sister Mary Lawrence was the dean. She called the 49ers a bunch of juvenile delinquents. <laughs> 
And Sister Lawrence, she was a really good person. We were having a, a talent, we decided to have a father-daughter party and we were having a talent show. And Sister Lawrence taught us how to do the Charleston, which we thought was a lot of fun. <laughs> and I still know how to do it. We, we were party people, but we were so close. When we had a party, everyone was invited. You, you had a lot of really, really good friends um, to react with, and um, that was a real plus. And, and we had people with a lot of energy and creativity. There were a lot of um, clubs. Everybody had a club. There was a Spanish club, an English club, the Green Quill. There was a science call club the retort or something like that, and German club, French club, and I loved the Glee Club. My best friend was Virginia Sonley, and we were both altos, and we did act up during Glee Club when she wasn't paying attention to us, but we just loved it. They were starting a Toledo Symphony. We had someone named Emma Andres Kuntz, and she started at, at Mary Mance on the stage with a lot of um, the in, people that played instruments that she knew who were good. And they started out there and went from Mary Mance College uh, into being the Toledo Symphony. Besides all the good teachers that we had, we had a lecture series. Fulton J. Sheen was here any number of times to talk, and the auditorium was full with not just Mary Mance people, but all over the city people came to hear him talk. Yeah, Mary Mance probably did a service to the city of Toledo by bringing in speakers that no one else would have brought in, and like Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, Tom Dooley, the Berrigan Brothers, they brought in the Shakespearean players who uh, every year put on a play and then Mary Mans had their own plays that they put on on the, the great stage it's still at Collingwood. I had one line, I'm very fond of superior society. <laughs> I had one oh, line. good for you, you remember. <laughs> well, we had some really talented people on the faculty, particularly in the art department. And I sat in one day uh, in the music department and I realized, my glory be to God, these people can sight read music I can't do that, so I lasted one class. And they, they were very, very talented. Mary Mance reached its high point in the 1950s and 60s. More students with varying interests meant that the college was constantly adding new courses and faculty. The college began offering graduate programs in the 50s, as well as a pastoral institute. By 1965, enrollment hit its peak at 1,500 students. With academic growth also came physical expansion. In 1964, a new dormitory was built to house the growing demand of boarders. Lord's Hall housed over 150 students and provided a cafeteria, infirmary, and lounge spaces in one location. In 1967, the new library was opened in what was formerly Epworth Methodist Church on the corner of Parkwood and Delaware. The three-story library included gallery spaces and a convocation center where many of the sponsored lectured series began taking place. I remember, I have a picture of me somewhere. Uh, they had a lot, they had banners. And I don't even remember what the banners were about, but it was filled with banners. And I'm leaning over that, the balcony on the second floor with all those banners hanging. And it was kept very nicely and it was, uh, people again were respectful. It was a small campus, so you were never lost on the campus. And the proximity of the physical buildings for classes was great because um, there was a stopping off point for day students called Brescia Hall. It was kind of like a student union for day students. We had a locker in a room and everybody's locker was in that room and there were big tables there so you'd come in in the morning and you dump yourself on the tables. So they established uh, a method of our camaraderie grew and by the, by the time your four years are over you really have had made some very very good friends. We had classes in all, all the buildings and one place that we were in more than all the classes was called the El Pinto and it was a rest, restaurant across the street <laughs> and whenever you were all bummed out you'd go over to the El Pinto and get a coke or a coffee 
and calmed down a little bit. The Pinto was across the street because the State Theater was there. And so the Pinto was next door. They had the best cinnamon toast. And we would solve the world's problems and our problems there. It was a different environment, a very different environment. My husband used to call it the White Glove Finishing School on Collingwood because everything was, was done properly. My impression was that they looked at the girls of Mary Mance as the goody-goody girls. That, you know, they never did anything wrong and they didn't have much of a life and they were all probably going to be nuns. It was a girl women's college, you know, and the concept of women in the time frame is completely different than it is today. You were expected to uphold what the values were of being a young Christian woman and, and behaving yourself. <laughs> you could not wear anything like shorts or slacks out unless you were going to a picnic or some athletic type of an event, that type of thing. So you were there with uh, a skirt or a dress. Sometimes girls would wear shorts and put their trench coats on over and not put the skirts on to go to the drugstore. I don't know how we didn't get caught though with having those shorts under those, oh my gosh. Despite the rules that set Mary Mance apart from state colleges of the time, alumni and former faculty alike recall not a rigid atmosphere, but an easy and welcoming environment. A small school has a lot to offer. The camaraderie was incredible. And he enjoyed the people, um, got involved. We attended every affair there was. There wasn't a, a tightness about the teachers, you know, you weren't intimidated by them. After I began teaching cosmology and theology, I clearly mandated that all my students had to celebrate Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's birthday, May 1st. It was simply an excuse to have a party. And we did every year have a party on May 1st. And as I said, at that time, I think the legal drinking age was considerably lower than it is now. So what we did was legal. I'm not too sure it was edifying. I mean, I just loved Father Bob Wilhelm's theology classes, and uh, he used to get my roommate and me mixed up. So uh, when I got up to give my report on my project, I was not going to have her get my grade. You know, I got up there and I wore a sign that said, Me Sandy. <laughs> and it was fine. The benefit of a small girls college was you blossomed. You got a little confidence with all the girls. I think it gave me a lot of courage. I used to be very shy. And I, I really think it was a, a place that valued me. When I was there, I felt comfortable with living in the dorm and with walking around the campus and actually with going across the street to the uh, different um, restaurants and that type of thing. But further on out, you could start to tell that there were some um, issues and possibly you wouldn't feel quite as safe. It was in the middle of the old West End because the old West End was pretty large and pretty beautiful. But as time went on and, and times changed, um, the neighborhood changed and that's just true of I'm sure any big metropolitan city. As Mary Mance entered the 1970s, the college saw several changes on the horizon. By 1970, steps were made to relieve the Ursulines of the responsibility of the college, creating a separate board of trustees, which included both nuns and laypeople. Following a nationwide decline in college enrollment, decreased government funding for private colleges, and a deteriorating neighborhood, Mary Mance's enrollment stagnated and eventually declined. Efforts were made to adapt to changing times and to recruit more students. In 1971, the college was declared co-educational and began accepting male students. By 1974, sweeping reform came to the student policies, including changes to the dress code and revisions to alcohol policies. Also, in 1974 came the inauguration of the first and only non-Ursuline president, Mr. William Salasis. Ursulines and alumni sponsored fundraising activities, while the development office worked to secure grants for funding. But despite its best efforts, the financial struggle was too great. 
In 1975, Mary Mance College announced that it must permanently close. I actually never graduated from Mary Mance. I was, it closed at the end of my sophomore year. It was, at, it was sudden, and they called us all together. I suppose you can liken it to, uh, you know, a place of work needing to close and making the announcement on one day. To have to close Mary Mans was devastating. It's, it's our baby for how many years? And but then you also see there are fewer sisters coming in, so you can't supply the teachers. You have to hire more lay people, and you end up having to pay a, a comparable, a living wage, and it, you can't do it. So it's. It's just devastating to have to close a college. The history of Catholic women's colleges is they don't survive. I don't think we had an overly successful athletic program. And by the 70s, that was becoming important for a university or a college to have. And if, if they would have known that was happening, they probably wouldn't have bought that property there. What they were looking at is the, I think, was the um, population of that area because there were lots of big families in that area. So I think part of it is the unavailability of land. I mean, we could have never bought houses in the Old West End to make that grow out and make it be better. It was just, it was, a, but when they bought the property, they didn't know that. But the size of the campus had a lot to do with it. It simply became a reality of they weren't getting enough students and, and didn't have enough financial resources to be able to continue a viable college. But there's always something to look forward to. Got, got, you know, the saying, God closes one door and opens another, you know? They helped every one of us find, even if we weren't finished with school, where were we going to go? They called in, they had like a college fair for us. It, it's hard, it's, it's, it's a, a morning, it's a morning that needs to take place, you have to allow it to happen. So I don't know how you do it. I don't know. I think they did it well, as well as they could. May have laid the foundation for the what is now Lourdes University. They were kind of in the situation that Mary Mance was in. I think they are making a rebound. They do have an active sports program, and they are attracting students from all over the place. So I'm very pleased with that. So maybe there was a, a needed foundation that had to be supplanted in order that Lourdes might thrive. A lot of things come and go in society, and they're there for a reason in that particular time. You know, the value of it's still there, even though the thing is gone. Yeah, I, th I think Mary Vance did, us, did for us what needed to be done. Small college, you know. I, I think Mary Vance was uh, for me, I mean, I was more than satisfied. I absolutely loved my four years at Mary Vance. I was very, very happy, and I thought it was the best education I could have received anywhere. But I think we were well prepared for whatever career we were going to, uh, to enter, and it was just such a, a part of our lives that we don't want it to die and we want other people to know that there was such a school. We did a lot good and I can own that as a sister now, as president of the community now, I can own that, that we did a lot of good. We taught others how to teach and that's what we were called to do at that time. In her last year or so, Sister Mary Lawrence Wilson would call me and she would say, Judy, you need to come over, I have to talk to you. It's very important. And every time I would go there, she would put her hand on my arm and she would say, please, try to keep the Mary Mance Alumni Association going. She didn't want the Mary Mance name to die just because the college had closed. She wanted people to know how it molded so many people's lives how it taught them life-sustaining skills, how it made um, all the difference in the world. We just wanted to make sure that people didn't forget about it. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. In its 53 years, Mary Mance College graduated over 3,000 young women and men, providing teachers, nurses, artists, 
social workers, musicians, and more. Its impact on Toledo and beyond is immeasurable. Though it may be closed, Mary Mance College will always be remembered. Support for Remembering Mary Mance College is provided by the Ursuline Convent of the Sacred Heart and friends and family of Mary Mance College and by viewers like you. Thank you.